morning. Please stand as we begin to worship the Lord. I just want to praise you forever and ever. I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done, you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for praising me. I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done you've done for me blessings and glory and honor they all belong to you thank you jesus for Shepherd, please stand for a couple more moments on this great covenant day that we have. Proverbs 12, 21. There shall no evil happen to the righteous, but the wicked might be filled with mystery. Lying lips and an abomination to the they that deal truly right. I want to ask you to read it again. God. You may, hey, be man, you, you may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. At this time, if you would uh, take a moment to go with us to the Lord in prayer. As you choose, every head bowed, every eye closed. Most gracious and holy Lord, your children have gathered once more on the Lord's day, a day which has been set aside to praise and to glorify your name. Ah, oh, speak on it. Even the speakers know how to declare that today right. is the Lord's day. Yes. And that all who come through those doors should come in prepared to say his name, Jesus. To thank him for what he's done for you this week, Jesus. And to thank you for what he's going to do for you next week, Jesus. And to thank him for what he is already doing for you today. Oh, think about it now. There are so many things going on out there. You cannot go anywhere without something going on, but somehow the Lord puts a fence all around you. He leads you in your comings and your going. He takes you to and he takes you fro. And before you know it, you find yourself standing in the safety of your living room. And all you can say is what? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's how you know you are his child. And he is your God. And that is what we should be striving for each day. That we have a relationship with the Lord such that we know that we know that we know that we know who we are. And Father, we just want to say thank you once again. And when we can't talk, we want to just wave our hands as a way of saying thank you. Or stomp our feet, whatever it takes, so that you know that we recognize who you are. The God of all God, the Lord of all Lord, the King of all kings, the maker of every good and perfect king. And we know, Lord, that it comes from you. So, Father, once again, as we come here today, we know that there's some who are here who'd love to be here. And we want to reach out to them today and just think about what it is they need, Lord, and supply their need. Whether they just did not feel well. And they need to get over whatever ails them. Give them that, that doctor's touch, that healing touch, that one that we know that only can come from you. 
when it takes that little extra to get going. And Lord, there's many of them who are out there with broken hearts. They're breathing and they're grieving. And they're trying to re, re, find that redirection that they need to just keep on pushing. To keep on pushing through. And as, as, as Paul said, just press on through toward that mark. And Father, they need your strength today, Lord. They need you to come and visit with them for a while and just give them that comfort that they need to know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And all I got to do is just stand on up, put one foot in front of the other, and he will guide me, he will lead me, and he will direct me. Because if I'm still here breathing, that means he's still got work for me to do. So, Lord, help them to get that work done now. And, Father, we come here today because I, I, I heard someone say that there is a word from on high. And all of us sitting here today came to hear that word that is from on high. And, Lord, we want you to open our hearts, open our minds, and let us receive what thus says the Lord today. Let us use it. Let us keep it. Let us store it. And let us give it to somebody else who needs to hear about that word from our God. So, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, we come today thankful. We come today joyful. We come today praising your name forevermore because we know who we belong to. In the name of Jesus, if it be your will, Lord, let it be done today. Amen. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Blessings, blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Blessings and glory. Church said amen. Church said amen again. I, I don't think you heard what the words of that song just said. It says blessings and glory and, and honor. Who do they belong to? It said they all belong to you. The blessings, the glory. Focus on the blessings, but the glory, the joy, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the glory, that glory that stopped by your bedside this morning and touched you with his finger of love and allowed you to get to the house of worship one more time, the glory. The glory that shines upon your face even when you don't deserve it. The glory. The glory that allowed his only begotten son to suffer, bleed, and die on the cross of Calvary but rose on the third day with all power in his hands. The glory belongs to him. So then that's why every Sunday and specifically on first Sunday we want to honor not just the blessings, but also his glory that simply allowed us in the image and likeness of him to walk on this earth. We want to honor him for his glory that he saw fit to give us one more chance to worship him for who he is in all of his glory. So, Father, we just pause in this moment to invoke your presence. We recognize that you're already here. 
We thank you that you've gone before us and you've made a way. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you that your glory shines upon us. We just want to honor you this morning. So whatever is said, done, or heard today, we do it for you, oh God. Move us out of the way so that your glory can fill this place. That we can leave this place different than we've come. That we can recognize the truest blessing of it all. That you're with us. And because you're with us, we have everything we need for life. So we honor you this morning. We praise you this morning. We worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. And the people of God said together, amen. amen. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Because he's worthy. He's worthy. Our scripture lesson this morning that we shall read together as you stand to your feet once again is taken from the 121st division of Psalms. So shall we read together? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. We'll now have a song of praise, I Need You Now. And the next voice that you hear will be of our own Reverend Douglas P. Griffin as he brings the message for today. Not a second or another minute. Not an hour of another day. But at this moment, with my arms outstretched, I need you. be 101 this month. Shh. They know. They know. They've heard. Um, well, I wasn't scheduled to preach today, <laughs> um, but there's uh, like a virus going around, so be, be careful. Um, Reverend Carlos contacted me last night and said that he was at Kaiser all day. Uh, now, the Lord had been telling me to get my sermon ready all day, and I was saying, get behind me, Satan. 
I've just preached twice in a row. Uh, I don't want to preach three times in a row. But God had different plans, so I wasn't surprised when he called, contacted me and said that he was um, uh, not going to be able to be here today. So my sermon on chapter 17 of Samuel actually had three parts. Uh, and so I guess this is what God wanted for today. Um, but again, be careful. I know, I know that my nephew, I just got word that he was rushed to the hospital this morning um, with pneumonia or something. So uh, anyway, just be careful. Take care of yourselves. Stay in prayer. So, but I'm sorry. Uh, Ethan. Uh-huh. No. Oh, Elijah. Oh, oh. Oh, that's not good. Help me. Thank you, Mary. Um. So we've been going through, I've been going through the book of Samuel because, and I call the teaching series The Path to Anointing God's Leader. Israel is trying to find their leader just like we are and, and move into the next area of what God has for them. So let's review last week, part two of um, Samuel chapter 17. It says, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So he's nine feet tall at least. And we all know the story of David and Goliath, but there's some things we're discovering that we aren't used to uh, looking at when we look at this chapter normally. Here's uh, the next verse. The Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. No one wants to come out and fight against Goliath. They're on two mountaintops. There's a valley in between. He's come down in the valley in between, and he's standing there. Come on, come on, bring out somebody. Um, now, the Philistines lived near the west coast, near the ocean, kind of today where Palestine is today, or the Palestinians are today along the coast. And Jerusalem is in the hills. It's, it's in the eastern part of Jerusalem. So that's where, uh, of, of Israel, so that's where Jerusalem is, and, and it's built around Mount Moriah and Mount, all these different mountains, right, where we get all these mountain churches that we have. Um, we used, we named them after those mountain areas. So the Philistines went across and up into the hill, and they're facing the Jerusalem area, they're facing that whole area there, and there's a valley in between, um, and he's saying, if we can settle this if you just bring out one person. Now, he doesn't know he's falling right into God's will. Goliath is asking for one person. No one person wants to go. But David hears about it. So last week we talked about, um, oh, so, so David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. They're all sitting there scared. The first week I talked about the 40-day test that God has in the Bible several times, at least on nine occasions, somebody went through a 40-day test where God wants to see, are you going to pass it and actually believe that I'm powerful? We think the test is from the devil. I'm sure when you were in high school, you thought some of your tests were from the devil. Some of your school teachers, you thought, is that a tale? But um, the test is from God to see, are you going to believe that God will lead, lead you through? Are you going to panic? Are you going to, oh, are you going to say, I know God can handle this situation? So... We talked about uh, the 40-day test. Last week, we talked about the, um, the, the attributes, the surprising characteristics of a giant slayer. Because we think they're these big, strong, we have these images of a giant slayer walks out and he's all buff. And No, a giant slayer has been put through a lot in life, but has learned that God will come through. So uh, the next verse, of it, so Saul clothed David with his armor and he, put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat, coat of mail. So he put all his, but, but David rejects it. Is that the next scripture? David rejects it. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I've not tested them. So David took them off. And that's where we ended last week. David's like, I can't wear your armor. And that's the lesson. I can't do what somebody else did. I can't be somebody else. I have, I have to be who God made me to be. So David is about to go and um, fight Goliath. 
So let's look at the next verse of today's lesson. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, David, oh, well, go and the Lord be with you. You're so confident. God bless you. Have a good time. Why was David so confident? Why did he know that God would deliver him? Because David was not scared at all. This is what's going to happen. What, the elements are actually there in this verse as to why, how David knew that he had the victory that day. And that's what I would like to teach on. Uh, today's lesson, I think, is how to know when you're facing undeniable victory. How to know when you're in that situation where it won't be denied. I want to teach the ways to recognize it because there are times when we're going to win no matter what. We have no choice. We're walking in undeniable victory. How to know? Okay, um, so here's what he says. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. You're just supposed to put just A there, just that part. We're just going to look at just, Your servant has killed both lion and bear. Um, this is what David has been through in his life. David has, can look at his life. He knows what he has done. He know, like you have a testimony, right, where, I, hey, I, I've been through this. The first thing that we have to recognize, the first way to recognize it is this. It says undeniable victory has three components. Oh, are those the three? That this, I don't know. Okay. I'm always fascinated. So your victory is assured when, one, you identify, accept, and then walk in your own anointing. Your victory is assured. If you can accept, identify what your gift is. David knew, I've already killed a lion and a bear. I know what my talent is. Everyone here, everyone here has a gift and an anointing from God. God has anointed everybody. We all have gifts differing. In fact, let's look at the scriptures that talk about that. Uh, in Romans it says, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you. To who? To who? To who? To everyone. I'm saying this to everyone who is among you. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We've all been given the same faith. Some people call up and say, I want you to pray because you have a lot of faith. And I want to say to them, you have a lot of faith too. You just don't know it. God has dealt to everyone the same measure. I don't have more faith than you. I do not have more faith than you. Uh, Sister King, Brother King, they don't have more faith than you. The Zekas don't have more faith than you. Nobody has. We've all been given the same amount of faith. We just don't know. We don't have confidence in that. But God, he says, I want you to know. Don't think of yourself more highly of the odd. Ooh, well, God answered my prayer. I must have a lot of faith. No, we all have the same faith. Think soberly. God has given us all the same gifts. The next uh, scripture I want to go to, he says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So there's a difference, right? My hand does something different than my foot. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they both do the same thing and they trip and fall over. But they're supposed to do different things. So the eye cannot say to the hand, why didn't you see that coming? Well, because I'm the hand. I don't, I can't, I, that's not what I do. I grab things. I work things. I hamper things. You're the eye. You're supposed to have seen that coming. And, and, and so the ear can't, the mouth can't say to my elbow, why didn't you speak up? Well, because you're the mouth. You're supposed to speak up. I'm the elbow. I join these two parts together. I make sure they work together. And some people in the body of Christ, that's what they do. You want them to be on the committee because they're good to help with joining people together. That's what they do. They're not going to say much because they're not the mouth. We all have different gifts, but everyone has a function. Every one of us has a gift. In fact, I think it's Corinthians is the next verse. Okay, so having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, it says. Although we have gifts differing, let, let us use those gifts. But we all have them. He says, I'm saying this to every single one of you. So the ability to identify what your talent is, whatever it is, the ability to identify it, 
to recognize, to accept it, to stop trying to be somebody else. And then walk into your own anointing will assure you victory in a situation. Uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians, it says, there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirit. There are differences of ministries. So we all have different things that we're going to do in life, but your gift is not m- smaller or bigger than mine, not more effective. or, or, or It's the same. And in a situation where somebody is stopped on the side of the road, their car is broken down, if I show up and and preach, uh, do a musical for them, that won't help fix their car. That that's not the gift that's needed in that point. But that's all I could do. If you know me, I'll say I'll write a musical about your car being broken down. Well, you know the tire got flat. I mean, I can write a song right there. That won't help them. So you might be good at at, at fixing cars, and in that situation, that's the gift that's needed. So if God is sending you into a situation, you can't look at somebody and say, oh, but look what they've got that gift. But you've got your gift. And in certain situations, that's exactly what's needed. So there are different gifts. There are different ministries. He says there are even, it's the same Lord. And there are different of activities, meaning, meaning they're different way they work. So you can have the same gift. Like I'm a preacher. James is a preacher. Carlos is a preacher. Uh, Calhoun, uh, all, we're, all, we're all preachers. But... We, it works, it says, when it says differences of activities, that means difference in how it works. When I get up and preach, it comes out differently than when James gets up and preach, or when Ollie gets up and preach, or, or Joey gets up and preach. It's, it's different. They work differently. So even if you have the same gift, he's saying it, it may work. So make sure you do it the way you're supposed to do it. I have not been able to do it differently since the first time you heard me preach in 1979. I'm just the same. I can't be different. Bless my heart. Some people are able to change, and they really shouldn't. If you want to tell them, be yourself. I am not able to. <sighs> to my uh, Anyway, he says, but it is the same God who works all in all. So I think the next, we're going back to, so the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one of us for the profit of all. God is going to manifest himself through everybody here in order to profit everybody. And if you're not using your gift, and you could just be the, there is a gift of hugging. There is a gift of hugging. There are, because you never, somebody have had a bad day, somebody was just, and, and they've gotten a good hug, and that has changed them. It has prevented a fight from happening. It was, I was, I was, I was on my way to sing somewhere, and they didn't have the mic situation right, and I was going to tell them off. I had had enough. And a friend called and said, I haven't talked to you in a long time. And, and the God just told me to call you right now. And I hadn't talked to this person in 15 years. God just told me to call you right now. And I, I had the speech already planned in my mind. I'm going to let them know. But they just called and said, I'm just calling to say hi. And God told me to call you. And I don't know why. And I went, uh, I know why. So I hung up the phone, and, and they just, their ministry was just calling people and saying hi. That's a ministry, because that stopped me from going in and showing my behind to those people and, and just being totally unnecessary. Went in, and, of course, then the mics got fixed, and, I, you know, and I would. And that was a, just that phone call, just somebody calling and saying, hey, I'm just calling to say hi. You think, I don't know why I'm doing this. That's a gift. And that, if that is your ministry, that every so often I just call people and check in. That's a ministry. But we have to recognize what your thing is. And when God is using you and you're walking in your anointing and the gift that you have, whatever that is, then it will be successful. You can, you can guarantee victory. Okay, I'm so, so David, I think the next group is, is David. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, so David's about to have a slingshot, right? Well, listen. 200 years before this, it says, and from the cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword, besides inhabitants of Gibeah, who numbered 700 select men. So the, the tribe of Benjamin is about to go to war with the other 11 tribes. The tribe of Benjamin, it says, has 26,000 people who, who are swordsmen, but there are 700 select men. Let me tell you about these select men. Next scripture. 
It says, among all these people were 700 select men who were left-handed, and everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. They could, that was their gift, to sling that stone. That was their gift. There were 700 of them. Left-handed, and, and, could, and, and they want you to know, because in that day, they thought there was something wrong with you if you had a left hand. Said, all these people were left-handed. And they wanted, but there's nothing wrong with having left, being left-handed. But that's what's their thing. They threw a stone with their left hand. Everybody else got wiped out. The 26,000 men were wiped out. The 600 sling throwers who didn't get in the battle because in order to fight a sword, I've got to get right next to you, right? I've got to get this far. But I can sling a stone at Mary from, from here. Now, I wouldn't get close to hitting her. I would in that window and everything else. But... The, the, all the sword people got wiped out. The, the, the slingers, they were saved. And the, of the tribe of Benjamin, that's all that left. They moved right outside of where David lived. David learned how to throw the, do a slingshot from these guys, right from the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't learn it because he thought, ooh, someday I'm going to slay Goliath. <laughs> he just thought it would be fun to learn. There's some little off thing that you've just did. I don't know why I learned to do this, but I know how to do this. And, and that's a gift. You don't know when that might come in, in handy. Somebody on the street who is starving and you know how to make a good brownie. I'm just making this up. That's your gift. When I show up, I'm going to sing a musical to them about, how, oh, you're on the street now. That's not going to help them. That brownie is what they needed in that moment. Right? And you think, oh, well, that, what? I just bake brownies. I don't know. You don't know how that could change somebody's life. Whatever your gift is, know it's a gift from God. Accept it. <laughs> Hush. And, 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 and go for it. Okay. So, uh, undeniable victory has three components, right? The second component, he says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. He's uncircumcised. We're circumcised. I've got a covenant with God, he's saying. And you have to have total commitment at that point to be circumcised. When, uh, let's look at, I think Genesis is a verse. He says, your victory is assured when you've committed to listen for and be obedient to God's voice and not your own. So you got to know what your anointing is, but you also have to have a commitment component that you're going to listen to God's voice. God told Abraham when he was 99, I think Genesis is the next verse, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you throughout the generations, next verse, he says, and this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And so he had a, 17-year-old kid at that point, 13, I think, um, Ishmael. Sorry, Ishmael, we have to circumcise you. That's commitment. Um, and when they came out of the wilderness, when they came out of the wilderness, God said, all you men 20 years and up, got to be circumcised. And they, I wish they'd had little thin scalpels. They had rocks that they would sharpen. You have to be committed. Yes, James Oliver, commitment. Commitment. God said to do it, I'm going to do it. Woo. So, if you have committed to God, you know what your gift is, but you're saying, Lord, I've got a contract with you. You are my savior. My covenant is with you. I'm committing to you. I'm going to listen to your voice. Every day I'm going to follow your, your will and your word. You can be assured of victory. Um, the next verse says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, because we we're not going to be circumcised today. I mean, at the age of 20 or 30 or 50. Or, but here's what he is asking for us today. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. Meaning, present yourself to God and say, Lord, I, I, I'm crawling on the proverbial altar. I'm presenting my whole self to you. I'm giving myself to you. 
I stretch my hands to thee. Come on and rescue me. I need you right away. And you're saying, Lord, I need you, Lord. I'm committing to you 100%. If we got and did that every day, we could be assured, Lord, I want to follow your voice today. I want to do what you want to do. I want to be your servant today. I think it talks about that in Proverbs. Is that what's next? No. So, oh, it says, do not be conformed to this world. This is the second verse of, in Romans. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be proved what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will know the good, acceptable, perfect will of God if you can, we can transform our minds by committing ourselves. If we commit ourselves, then we are transformed from following the world's advice to following the God's advice. God knows how t- today is going to work out. If, if God's saying, I think you better get that David and Goliath sermon ready. <sighs> okay, God, but you know, Carlos is preaching tomorrow. And God's giggling like, I know that he's not. You think he is. I, there are things that God tells us to do. I think you better take an umbrella. Uh-uh, the weatherman said it's going to be sunny all day. Okay, but you know, I created the rain, so you can decide who you want to listen to. If we could become best friends with God, there's not a situation in our life where we don't walk in already having all the answers. It's like having a cheat sheet for a test because the person who's administering the test is the one whispering the answers in our ears. We can walk through life getting A's on everything, passing everything because we've committed. Lord, you lead me today. Every step I take, I want it to be ordered by you. So is that the Proverbs verse? That was next. Yes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lead not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. With all your heart, in all your ways, in everything that you're doing, Lord, I'm acknowledging you just as I'm trying to decide what cereal I'm going to have. Lord, I just want to be open to your leading as I'm getting dressed today. Should should I take a jacket? If we're just talking to God all day like he's your best friend, then you're going to walk and, and be successful in every situation. Because God knows what is happening five minutes from now, five days from now, five years from now. And we're listening to him. We'll be successful. We won't run up against the roadblocks that we're used to running into. Okay, so I think we're back to undeniable victory has three components. Uh, So here's the third part of the verse. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he's uncircumcised, but I'm circumcised. I have a covenant. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. So David knew that Goliath was already defeated because God had given them that land. And he's defying that. And so I know I'm going to win because this land already belongs to God. He's defying the armies of God. God told us to come and occupy this land. Now, this is for the church because God has told us to come and occupy this land. That we're here. And so we can have victory if we have the same mindset. So l- let's look at the progression of this. In Genesis, God talked to Abraham. So your victory is assured when you recognize God's will, God's mission, and God's purpose. When you recognize God's will, his mission that he's sending you on, and the purpose, you know you're going to win. You know that you're going to win because God's purpose is always fulfilled. He said, my word does not return to me void, but it accomplishes the thing into which I've sent it. And so if you know I'm walking in God's will right now, I know what God's will is. I know what his purpose is in the situation. I cannot lose. So um, in Genesis, he says, he tells Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. The next thing. He says, and I will make you a great nation there, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'm not just sitting there to make you a landowner. I'm sitting there so that you can be a blessing to those around you. I'm going to make you a great nation. God's purpose was to send Abraham and have a people that would occupy that land, and through those people, he would show himself powerful to the rest of the world. I'm going to do miracles in your midst. You're going to see... uh, Seas part and, and the, the blind sea and lame walk. I'm going to make you a great, powerful, prosperous nation so that the world will see those people worship the living God. I want what they've got. 
So I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to bless you. And then you'll be a blessing to other people. So when God sends a, a people to occupy a land, he expects them to be a blessing to those around us. This church is here in this community so that we can be a blessing. He wants to make us great. He wants to bless us, make us a mighty, full nation so that, the, so that we have to use the overflow like James kept prophesying yesterday. So that you can't even get a seat in here because of all the people who are hungry for the word of God. And we're going to have to send them to the fellowship hall and, and have to put a television there so they can watch the service. That that's his vision so that he, we can be a blessing to the neighborhood. So that's why he wanted them in Israel. As you know, when, they, when he gave them the first opportunity, they refused to do it. So here in Numbers, I think, is whatever's next. In Deuteronomy, he says, look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. When it's finally time to do it, go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. He's already said it before. Just possess what I've already given you. I've given you the land. Do it. Right? It's yours. But they didn't do it. So I think next I have the punishment. So the Lord says to them, you know, I have pardoned. Because Moses says, don't, don't kill them all. Uh, he says, okay, I've pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Even though they're not going to do it, the earth's going to be full of the glory of the Lord. So I'm going to have to get new people who will do what I have to say. Because I'm not going to let them start, stop me. I'm going to fill the earth with my glory. God's going to fill this neighborhood with his glory. I don't know if it's going to be us or new people. But he didn't put us here just to come in and sit and listen to a lesson and go home. He put us here to be a light because he wants to fill this neighborhood with his glory. And everywhere he plants a people, that's what he's wanting. So he's like, okay, I'll pardon them, but I'm going to get some new people, and I'm just going to do my thing. The next scripture. So he says, Marvel, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, like, oh, no, they're going to be victims. No. Who today have no knowledge of good and evil. It's not them. They shall go in there, and to them I will give it, and they'll possess it, since you won't. And God says that to every generation. Hey, generation, you're either going to do what I ask you to do, or I'll have, I'll just, your children will do it, or their children will do it, but you're not going to stop me from filling the earth with my glory and my power. Okay, so the next scripture. So when it was time to go over, God says to them, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So just go. Everywhere that you step, I've already given you that land. Well, what happens if I don't step there? Well, then I don't get the land. But not because God hasn't given it to me, because I've been too afraid to step there. So are there places out here we're afraid to just claim? Should we be walking around the neighborhood and stepping everywhere and saying, this belongs to God, this belongs to God, this area will be gone. Lives will be blessed in this area. Are we walking to that, that parking lot across the street and saying, people are going to be healed in this area, people are going to be delivered in this area, this belongs to God. Everywhere the sole of my feet is trotting, it belongs to God. That's our choice. But he said, we don't do it, somebody else will. So here's what happened. Here's what happened. In Judges, it says the Lord's with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineer people, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they, they had chariots of iron. Like, uh-oh, they saw them and went, wait, they got chariots of iron. We got these wooden chariots. So they didn't go there. Had they gone there, had their feet just stepped there, God would have given them the land. But they wouldn't go. So the Philistines grow, they're bringing in giants, and there we are. Goliath's going, ha, 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 here we are. We lived in the lowlands, and now we're here ready to take your land. David knew that's not going to happen. God has already given us this land, so we're going to win, and God's looking for David's. So let's look at it as it progressed. So the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. My, the God of Dagon cursed you. And the God of Asherah cursed you. They're not real. That's why David said, I'm coming to you in the name of the living God. You're talking about these dead gods. He says, uh, uh, you, he said, because David had his staff. 
and a slingshot. That's all you got? Yeah, that's all I got. That's my gift. So he says to David in the next verse, and the Philistine said to David, come on to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I'm going to cut you up and let the birds eat you. The vultures will come, and so we'll be done with it. And David's like, okay. I'm walking in my anointing. I know I got that slingshot thing down. I got this staff thing. I know that I'm circumcised, so I've got a covenant with the living God. And I know that he's already given us this land, so I'm assured victory. Because I know what God's purpose is, and it's for us to have this land, not you. So David says to him, then David said to Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. That's why you lose. You're coming against God. Hey, drug dealers, you're coming against God. That's why you lose. Gang members, you're coming against God. He owns this property. He owns this neighborhood. He's going to fill it with his glory so you lose. I already know that. But am I going to step up to them or am I going to wait on the hill and quake? So David says next, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He says, the earth will be filled with my glory because somebody someday is going to believe me. He's going to claim it and walk in it and step on it and say, this land belongs to God. And that's why you lose. Next, he says, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to me, David, that David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He couldn't wait. He couldn't wait. I'm in a hurry to, to not, because I know I win. How can I, how can I lose? I've already been given this land 200 years ago. Just waiting for that generation, waiting for that David. Next. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistines, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. If we will just walk in God's power, walk in his anointing, they will flee. They can't stand up to the power of God, the might of God. So let's be a strong church, not come here just to meet but we declare in Jesus' name, these pews will be full of those who are hurting. The homeless are going to come. The sick are going to come. Prostitutes are going to come off the street. People are going to come to this church in need, and we're going to be there, ready to meet their needs. Because the earth will be filled of the glory of the Lord. We cannot lose if we will step in our anointing and God's purpose and his will in our lives. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much that you already have the ending planned. You told us that you reveal the end from the beginning. You've already told us that we win. So help us be that generation that takes your word for it and reaches out to a dying, hurting, sick world and brings them your glory. We don't want another generation to follow us and have to do our work for us. Let us be that generation that really believes all and opens the doors to your glory and steps everywhere the soles of our feet are led and claim this whole neighborhood for you. And we'll give you the glory where it belongs. Thank you for your will and your purpose. Help us to be those that fill it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm going to invite our um, announcing secretary, um, church clerk. You know, I don't have words, but I can write a song about it. And actually, and I'm just um, grateful that she's here. She, she, now, she, you would, she had a death in the family recently, lost an, an, an uncle but is just here serving the Lord. Um, and, is, and so I'm just, I just want you to know that our, our hearts are with you. We're praying for you. But you, you go ahead and, and come. Hey, everyone. 
our church is now accepting applications for pastor. Praise God. Round of applause for that. It's been a Man. long time. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we're accepting applications uh, starting June the 1st through August the 1st of this year. Go to our website, Good Shepherd. Jim, Good Shepherd MBCLA.com and follow the application instructions. There are three ways to, to apply. Fill out the application online directly. You can print out the application and email it, and you can, or you can print the application and mail it a direct copy to the church at 50, was this 510 West 53rd Street, LA 90037 with the attention of Pastor Search Committee. Our social media outreach, we have a social media outreach ministry, and they were looking for volunteers to join the social media team. If you are interested interested in or know someone, please let us know or contact Doug Griffin over there. Special Father's Day celebration. Special Father's Day celebration is Sunday, June the 18th at our 11 o'clock service. Hopefully everyone can come out. And Bible study in Sunday school has not changed. Our times are still the same. Um, on Doug Griffin's page, at a Facebook page at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. And the church's uh, page at, at, 8. at 8. And then a Sunday school on Doug Griffin's page at 9 a.m. live. And then a Good Shepherd's page at 10 a.m. And... The family of Bessie Jean Peaches McKinney, McNeely, I'm sorry, McNeely is so blessed and thankful for all the prayers that were sent their way. The viewing will be held Thursday, June the 8th. Oh, bless my heart. Pray, pray for the ears. <laughs> the viewing, the viewing will be held uh, Thursday, <coughs> excuse me, Thursday, June the 8th, 2023, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Angela's Funeral Home, located at 3875 South Crenshaw, L.A. That's L Crenshaw Boulevard. That's L.A. 9008. Her homegoing service will be held Friday the 9th at 10 a.m. right here at Good Shepherd Baptist Church, 510 West 53rd Street, L.A. Cal 937. And the repast will be at, in our fellowship hall just right next door. And now I'll turn it back over to Doug. Right. So, um, Alexander, don't, don't cut away because we're going to want the communion service to also be live. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so we do want to come and support this. I'm sorry? Oh, support the Sutton Chapman uh, family as they celebrate the Aunt Peaches. That's all I know. Or as. Right. Mother, aunt, uh, grandmother, all that, she, all that she was and celebrate her life. She lived a wonderful life. She, you knew her. She's a wonderful person. Uh, for the offering, there's a green button you can go to that says online giving. Or you can use PayPal. You can even do that during the, during the, the service. If you want to use PayPal. Those of you who know what that is, eventually there will be people here. There will be uh, Giancarlo will be leading a group of 30 or 40 um, young people, teaching them Taekwondo. And um, they'll want to use PayPal in order to pay their tithes. So we, we are already, we are equipping the church for the crowds that are coming. Because they're coming. Um, social media, so there, are, there are kids who like to be on social media and do, what are those things? Um, TikTok, tweets and Posts and on things. Clearly not me. So if you know how to do it, which I'm looking at you, and I know some of you don't even know how to work your cell phone, but if you have kids that want to do it or who like social media, we would love uh, them. I just happen to be looking at you for no reason. But, you know, you just never know. Um. But if, so if someone in your family may be into that, we want a social media team so we can keep reaching out. 
Now I'm going to invite the, the deacons to come forward as we prepare for our communion service. Um, social media. Oh, and for our Father's Day, we do want to do something special. So also, deacons, if after service you will um, meet with me just very quickly so we can figure out what we're going to do. They did a beautiful job, I felt, on the, uh, for Mother's Day. Uh, one person was inadvertently overlooked uh, in the giving of flowers. It was totally inadvertent, of course. And so um, we want to make sure that we also honor the fathers in the same way. Having strong fathers in our community is very important. Uh, so we want to do something for the fathers also. Now, Jesus said as often as you do this. We do it on first Sundays. We could do it every Sunday. We could do it every day. He says as often as you do it. We're doing this in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. What he did on the cross, because he, he's like, I want you to understand what happened on the cross when the blood was shed and my, my body was broken for you. So, um, because they were used to having to go to the temple every day and an animal was killed and uh, blood sacrifice and all this. And he says, Jesus did it all on the cross. It's a simple thing. And I know you're used to big pageantry and big ceremony, but the sacrifice was already done. So I'm going to teach you how to understand that the blood washes away every sin. Every sin you will ever commit has been forgiven. It's our job to accept forgiveness, to acknowledge the sin and just accept the forgiveness that's been given to us. And our physical well-being was also taken care of by the broken body. And he says many are sickly and die early among you because not, he says not understanding what happened with the body of Christ. But that's the reason why we can ask for peace of mind our emotions to be taken care of, physical healing, because his body was broken for all of that. And so as often as you do this, we need to understand what the blood and the body represent. So I'm going to ask the uh, deacons to pass out the blood and the wine that we have, our grape juice and our little wafer. And it's just representative of the Christ. If somebody's at home and you want to take out, you can take out some orange juice and a Ritz cracker. It's not the actual body and the blood. It's just representative of it. We know that this isn't the actual body and blood of Christ. But you're welcome to take it with us uh, at home and share in the communion. Amen. Mountain, Mount Valley, the, the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never, never lose its power. That's the good news. The blood will never, ever lose its power. Oh, it reaches to wherever you are in your life, to the highest mountain. That's the good news. We can never get far away from God's love. And it flows to the lowest valley. Has everybody been served? If so, I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to open our plastic. 
and we're going to put it back in when we're done. So we're going to take the body first. It says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And you have to very carefully open the top. Bless my heart. I have told it wrong every time. Every time. Bless my heart. So the bread is at the bottom. That's why, and I always spill it on me. So you know this is not my gift. Understanding mechanical things. This is too confusing to me. So you know I can't do a car. Okay, so we're going to open up the bread. As the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we thank you, Lord, for your physical healing. For your body that was broken for us. It says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Amen. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right before we leave, do we have anyone visiting with us for the first time? So is that, is that Michi? Not embarrassing. You said you'd be here first Sunday, and you, you kept your word. So we just want to acknowledge that. Amen. It's good to see you. Part of the Johnson family who uh, had home going, home going of, of a relative recently of Gerald. Uh, but they've come to celebrate with us. So if there aren't any further announcements, yes, sir. Ah, thank you so much. As we're standing, I just want to invite, if there's anyone at home who does not know Jesus as your Lord, you weren't able to say, yes, he's my Savior and I've been circumcised. Well, no, but you're, he's my Savior and I can walk in that anointing because I know my purpose, you are free to say a prayer right there. Say, Jesus, I want to know you in that same way. I want you to be in my life. I want to know my purpose. I want to know my gifts. I want to know all that you have for me. And you invite him into your life, and he's there. It's just that simple. If you have done that, if you've prayed at home, that simple prayer, and I know, well, that's too easy. But that's what it is. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. It's that simple. Call us and let us know at 323 323- Two three two zero nine five six. because we want to pray with you. Um, and now let's bow our heads. Father, again, we thank you so much for your will being done in our life. We thank you for all that you have for us. We thank you for everyone here today that you brought to be in this service. We thank you for the blood that was shed for them, the body that was broken for them. We thank you for their physical healing. We thank you for the salvation, for the forgiveness, for all those within the sound of my voice and beyond. Father, we'll give you the glory. We ask the Lord to bless them and keep them and make his face to shine upon everyone here and let his countenance be upon them and grant them peace. And now, unto him who is able to keep us from falling, the only wise and true Savior be all majesty, power, and glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.